Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm really glad to be with you here this, this day. And uh, I really enjoy teaching and increasingly speaking, preaching and everything with from the Word of God. <clears throat> it's not something that I, uh, let's see if I can get this one right first. It's not something that I necessarily enjoyed doing or wanted to do when I first became a Christian. <laughs> After I went to Bible college, and uh, then overseas, a year later, I was overseas, and that was 1984, so I've been in full-time mission since then. I was about evangelism and leading people to Christ and training and getting more people going out, doing evangelism, recruiting people, and uh, you know, creating some curriculum to help train people. We did that in the Philippines, where we trained about 80 people in uh, two and a half to three years in Muslim ministry. So recruiting and training, sharing vision, and increasingly over time, the Lord's given me, given me a love for preaching the Word of God along with teaching, kind of going together. So let me just pray for us once more. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your Word, how wonderful it is, God, to study it, just to think of you, God, in all of your ways, just the magnitude of your mind and your knowledge and wisdom, God. Your purpose is for everything in this universe. And for us right now, God, becoming more like Jesus. And we'll stand before you in heaven and nothing will count except that we have followed you with all of our heart and soul and mind. Thank you, Lord. And now, God, bless us with your word. And by your Holy Spirit, speak into our hearts, Father. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. When I came to Christ, I was 20 years old, a university student, studying engineering. And from there, a year later, I was in Bible college. And it was there, the first, one of the first classes I took on Genesis, that I realized, wow, evolution is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> kind of had to sort that out. <laughs> so you can see I was fairly new, and, and knowledge of the Word of God, and applying it to our lives, Surrendering of our life to Christ. Wow, how, how essential that was. And I had a lot of issues in my life. I tried committing, you know, I, I contemplated committing suicide. Sometimes I had a lot of brokenness inside that God had to bring about healing. That's an ongoing process. So even though I surrendered my life to the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to go anywhere you want me to go, to do anything you want me to do. No matter when you call me to do that or to Tell me to do that at no whatever cost, seemingly here on earth, humanly speaking, no matter what the cost, that's what I want to do, to follow you. And so that then was kind of like the permission God gave, opening up my heart, giving God permission, surrendering areas of my life that God began to work in my life to change me. So then I came to the point of being in overseas missions, not perfect, but following the Lord as a disciple. Someone who's committing his face set to the focus of following the Lord's path. And after some time being overseas, India and Pakistan and other countries, and doing evangelism, and <clears throat> uh, other various things, I finally ended up in the Philippines for a few years. And at one point, we were, uh, we'd go and do outreach and go into the marketplace. And so there were these Muslims, and they would have like a little table, a little stand, and with a cloth or something, and they'd be selling things. I just personal business in the market area, the open air markets. And so I went into the market, <clears throat> and I saw, oh, I can see here these Muslim guys sitting there. And it was a mixture. It was up in the north. Most of the Muslims in the Philippines in the south. There's about 5 million Muslims in the Philippines that speak 14 languages. So here they were, we were up in the north. And uh, <clears throat> so I went out, and, and I just went over and talked to this guy, and I had my book bag. I had different languages in there different Muslim languages, as well as the national language, Tagalog, and some English stuff. And so I was talking, he knew English quite well. And so uh, I was talking to him, after a while he said, excuse me, can you tell me, I've heard about this thing being again born. What is that? <laughs> I said, well, okay, I guess I can tell you. So of course I proceeded to start talking to him, the Lord, and it just so happened, I almost never had this book. I haven't had this little book in English by Billy Graham, How to Be Born Again. I never carried that book with me. So I, have, I gave it to him, I was showing him a book, and while I was doing this, the other Muslims sitting at their place were watching me 
And some of them started to get up and they came over. So here I was standing there talking to this Muslim guy and some other Muslims were standing around us. You know, it's probably about five or six guys. It felt like 10 or 12. But five or six guys standing around us and this one fellow came up and he was looking up at me and he said, I have to defend Islam. So once in a while you run across somebody like that who feels like they have to stick up for Islam and for them it's kind of like, you know, honor. <clears throat> Since Islam is an honor and shame culture. And so he, he knew a little bit and he started to say, oh, your scriptures are corrupted. <laughs> and of course, if you go back into the thinking of Muslims, they, they have an interesting progressive understanding of inspiration that the old scriptures then are no longer, you know, they're, they were for that time. So the books of Moses were for the time of Moses. And in the time of David, the Psalms, of, that was for the, during the time of David. And the Gospel and the Injil, that is the, the New Testament or the Gospels, well, that was for the time of Jesus. Now we have the Book of Muhammad, and that's for today. And he's the last prophet, by the way, and, and it's for everybody forever. So they have this interesting concept, and he says, oh, your scriptures are corrupted, and, and if you read in there the Son of God, oh, look, so you've changed it more. Or if you see that I have done some study and I have marginal notes and underlines, look, you're trying to change the, the Bible more. So anyway, we talk through these common questions or misunderstandings they have. And so, but I, but I knew in that instant, instance, it wasn't that we were going to sit down and just have a discussion and try to understand the truth. He was at that point trying to stick up for Islam. And so I just gave him a short answer. And then he said, oh, and this question, you believe in the Son of God, like this. And for them, you know, again, that's a misunderstanding. They think back from the very beginning when Muhammad was running around in the Middle East and he met nominal Christians who were praying to Mary, the mother of God, and to Jesus, the Son of God, and to God the Father, and those are your three gods. And so the Muslims at that time, and that lie is still perpetuated to this day, that God the Father had a union with Mary, and then they had their son Jesus, and that's what they think you as Christians believe. So I, I tell them immediately, oh no, anybody who believes that, you know, they've gone away from the truth. And some hardcore Muslims, you can tell them, oh, they're gonna burn in the fire of hell. Oh, that's really good. For the hardcore Muslims. <laughs> Those are minority, by the way. So it was a good chance just to dialogue with, or stand up there and answer his questions. And as I was answering his questions, giving good answers, you know, he was kind of agitated, and I was calm. Because the Holy Spirit is in us. If we read through the first several chapters of the Gospel of John, and seeing how he was bringing spiritual truth, revealing spiritual truth to each one of those that he talked to, each individual, different situations, we see that he was calm. There was the sense of, of, the, of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He was filled with God's Spirit. And he was able to speak kindly and yet firmly to share the truth. And so here I was talking to this Muslim guy, and the Lord was helping me. Not because of myself, but because of the Lord helping me. And I was able to be calm and smile and you know, your evangelism smile, and you're sharing the gospel with these people. <clears throat> and all these Muslims are standing around watching me. And so after a while, I answered all his questions. And then he stood there, he looked at me, didn't know what else to say. He just said, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. <laughs> and so I just kind of patted him on the shoulder and said, oh, that's interesting. And just smiled at him. And you know, God wants us to love those people, even those, those who are misguided, who are maybe confronted at some point. Occasionally you meet people like that. Others, oh, I don't want to listen to you, and they walk away. But he was one of those. And so I just smiled at him. I just showed kindness to him. And he looked at me, and he didn't know what else to say. He just turned around and walked away. So all of those Muslims standing around me, they're, wa they're watching me and they're watching him through this conversation. And then they watched him walk away. Then they turned to me and said, oh, can I have that book too? So I was giving out the book to all those Muslims who were there, and we had some more conversation about Jesus. People are hungry the world over. People are hungry the world over. You think that there's a terrible situation in the Middle East with ISIS? How long do I have, by the way? No one ever gave me a time frame. Just 20 more minutes. Oh, man. So you've heard, this is a big thing, right? It's been going on now for some time, ISIS. And we hear the terrible downturn of the situation there. But the untold story 
is that there are thousands in Iraq, even tens of thousands of Muslims over the last many years that have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And now it's starting amongst the Syrians. They're starting to see a turning. Not me, I'm not there, but I hear from people who know what's going on there. <clears throat> that they're now a turning to Syrians to Christ. Syrian Muslims coming to know the Lord. And so in the horror of the situation, that we would wish upon no person, and yet God is allowing by his power to rip people out of their false beliefs, their trust in things that have no power for salvation, so that they are left with nothing. Maybe they're just terrified, and they're looking for reality, and they're not finding it in Islam. And so even some of those fundamentalist Muslims, or even those people who are like Taliban in Afghanistan and others, you know, they've come to faith, they're coming to faith in the Lord. Not all, but some are coming to know the Lord. And we just thank God for that. Well, we want to look in the Gospel of Luke, and I noticed that they put in a little outline in your, uh, uh, your handout this morning, if you wanted to follow along. So let's just think, just to give a bit of background before we look at the, the Great Commission, that is, that part of the Great Commission that is in the Gospel of Luke. Let's just do a little bit of an overview of this Gospel. And first of all, then, is the inclusive nature of Luke. In Luke, God includes more stories of non-Jewish people than any other gospel. God also mentions ten women in the gospel of Luke that are not included in any other gospel. So then, as we think about our text, which is Luke 24, verses 46 to 47, and why don't I just take this opportunity to read that, starting in verse 45, then he, that is Jesus, opened their minds, the ones that he was walking with, so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of his sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So then as we think about this text, which is the gospel message for all people in every nation, isn't the Lord showing us by example through the emphases through the gospel of Luke, this very thing, the diversity of people to whom he is including in the gospel message. So there we have it, the essential elements of the gospel message in Luke 24. And it doesn't matter whether they're Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist, Whatever culture they're from, whatever language they're from, we see that this is the a basic gospel message that everyone needs to believe in. Nothing more, nothing less. This is the essential elements of the gospel message. So that's the first part, the inclusive nature of Luke. Secondly, the salvation emphasis in Luke. In Luke, we see the noun form of the word salvation or savior used eight times. With only one time does that occur in all the other Gospels put together? Now that doesn't mean that they're not concerned about salvation. They are. As well, the verb to save is present in Luke more than any other book in the New Testament. That's the salvation emphasis, but then there's a couple of other words that go along with that that help to give some, uh, some emphasis to this word salvation. And the first one is two words, now and today. So in Luke, the word now is used 14 times, seven in the rest of the Gospels. The word today is used 11 times, nine in all of the rest of the Gospels put together. And finally, the word joy or rejoice in Luke. Interesting. Joy, rejoice. Those words in Luke more than any other book in the New Testament. Wow. Now I'm going to just think about those things for a minute. Why would God do that? Why is that emphasis in this particular gospel? <clears throat> Perhaps it's because God's focus in Luke, the gospel message of salvation, which is our text, we just read that. So obviously, if this is the gospel message and it tells the essential elements of how to be saved, then the emphasis through Luke would be on salvation, would it? Yes, it is. Therefore, 
not only is, it, is the message of salvation in here, we see that expressed throughout the book of Luke, but it's also the emphasis on when you hear the gospel message, it's an encouragement to people. Now, if you hear the gospel, today receive the Lord. That doesn't mean it's, it isn't a process for people to come to Christ. It was a process for me. But they're encouraged to consider this message now, today, the truth of salvation through God. And then the word joy. Well, what's the result of receiving, our, of receiving the Lord? Mm -hmm. Having forgiveness. Oh, finally, peace with God. My shame is taken away. My guilt. Then it comes what? What comes after that? We know the Lord. The Lord loves us. What comes? What's, what, what do you think would be something that would follow on after that? Peace. Peace and joy, maybe. Yeah. Joy. And as I've learned to walk with God, sometimes I don't feel that joyful. I have to go back to the Lord. Oh, I'm going through some trial. You know, I feel like, like the enemy's attacking. I'm feeling discouraged about something. And I come to the Lord again. And wow, I can come back to God and just pour out my heart to Him, my tears to Him. <sighs> Peace comes again. And joy in the Lord. <clears throat> so there's a walk of the Lord with joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Thirdly, then, there's geographic progression in Luke. Geographic progression. The Gospel of Luke can be outlined in this way. So the first three and a half chapters is the birth and beginning of Jesus. And then halfway through chapter 4, and all the way up to the very end of chapter 9, what do we see? We see that Jesus is in Galilee. In fact, it doesn't say it in this, it's not so clear in Luke, but in Mark, it's clear that Jesus went on a, a Gentile ministry trip. He went up in today what would be Lebanon, this around the southern tip of Syria, and ended up in Jordan, the east side of the Jordan River. And that's where the, the feeding of the 4,000 took place, and it was to Gentiles. So Jesus did that. So here he is, he's, in, he's up in, uh, in Galilee, and he's beyond Galilee. And then we see from the end of chapter 9 all the way through to the end of chapter 19, so for 10 chapters, few geographic references, but he's on a journey. Jesus is on a journey, and he's going to where whatever he senses the Lord leading him, that is the Holy Spirit in him, he's in obedience to the Father, he's following the Lord, and it's story after story, not just randomly thrown together, but there's a purpose and a reason for it. And so he's on this journey and following God and ministering, to whomever God brings in his path and to wherever the Lord leads him. He's on his journey. He's on a journey to Jerusalem, going through into Judea and ending up in Jerusalem, chapters 19, the end of 19, 20, and 21. So for those two chapters, he's there, he's doing ministry in Jerusalem, and then from chapter 21, verse 1 to the end, his death, resurrection, and ascension. What's interesting to me is that God's progression in Luke is different than any other of the Gospels. In fact, the outline of Luke, which is you know, beyond you know, Galilee and beyond Galilee, through Samaria, down to Judea, and finally into Jerusalem, seems to be the reverse order in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The geographic expansion of the Gospel from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. No wonder then that just before the ascension, Jesus gives us that part of the Great Commission in Luke, which is the Gospel message. So the Great Commission in Luke 24, verses 46 and 47, details what? What is it? The essential elements of the Gospel message. It is the theological summary and focus of the Gospel of Luke. And we don't need, I don't need to go through and just explain that in detail to you right now. I'm assuming that probably most everybody here understands what happened when Jesus, who was God in the flesh, who was without sin, took our sin upon himself, was beaten and abused and then crucified. And when he was crucified, what happened? You know, this, well, I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute. And then, of course, he <clears throat> rose from the dead and uh, he made available to each person, to all who would receive him, all who would believe upon him, they would repent and put their faith in him to receive the Lord. But how do I take that gospel message and apply it to different cultures, 
to different pe people from different religious backgrounds, how do I apply this gospel message? I don't want to change it, but how do I do that? Whether they're Sikhs or Muslims, or maybe they're atheists, agnostics, who don't believe in God, how do I apply this gospel message to them? What do I do when they have objections to certain parts of it? In other words, they're believing in certain lies. So let's just gonna use it. Islam as an example. And I'm gonna give you some stories and some instances of how you can apply the gospel message to someone who is from a different cultural background. So in Islam, the suffering and death of Jesus is denied. And because they deny his death and uh, suffering, there is no resurrection. Jesus was just taken up to heaven like Elijah, whom they called Elias, and then another was killed in his place. So how do we answer Muslims who believe that Jesus didn't die? Well, when a Muslim denies that the death of Jesus is because he is thinking that he is honoring the Lord. Well, if you look back in history, didn't uh, <clears throat> Abraham, with his household servants, he went and rescued Lot when these kings were at war with each other, and here's his army, and God helped him to overcome that, and he, he was able to rescue Lot and other people from being brought as, you know, captured as slaves by these other kings. And Abraham died as an old man. God was with him. He was a prophet of God. And Allah, God, is all-powerful. So how then, if God's all-powerful, would he not protect his prophet? He died as an old man with his family. We can say the same thing about Moses, about David, old men, the children, their families, and he did all of those things. And then we come to Jesus, and he was barely in his early 30s. He never was married, didn't have children. And all of a sudden, at the hands of these pagan unbelievers, they whip him and beat him, and they're mocking God, and they're dis treating him disgracefully. And the Muslim says, no, God is all-powerful. God protected Jesus, who they say in Arabic, Isa, or Yesu. God protected Jesus, and he took him up to heaven. So in a Muslim's thinking, they are trying to honor Jesus. I've had a Muslim talk to me and say, well, I believe in Jesus. Don't you believe in Muhammad? How would I answer that? Well, we don't have time for a seminar. <laughs> we can talk about that later. There's good answers for all these questions. You just have to work out and kind of understand it. There's lots of resources now available, especially through the internet. You can get all of this stuff. So how would I respond to a Muslim who thinks that they're honoring God. What well, Jesus says in John chapter 10, no man takes my life, but I lay it down for the sheep. If I'm talking to my Muslim friend, I can explain that Jesus suffered for him and myself. He chose to do that. He could have wiped out all those that were abusing him. He could have come down from that cross and healed himself. In fact, it is like as if there was a burning fire right here and I step up and I put my arms in the fire and the flames are burning my flesh, burning out my skin, the turning black it is burning it right down to the bones. I'm holding my arms in there one hour, two hours, three hours. Isn't that what Jesus did really on the cross? He, he, he had to hold himself onto that cross because he had all the power of the universe to come down and heal himself. Instead, all the power of God was there with him so he could hold himself onto the cross and suffer in the flesh, experiencing that for you and for I. The punishment that all the world should have received for our sins, we can be forgiven for through Jesus. So I'm talking to a Muslim and say, Muhammad or you know, Ahmad or <clears throat> whatever his name might be, Abdul, Abdul, I say, you know, because of your sins and mine, we're unclean before God. God cannot accept us in heaven. It's another time. I was in Pakistan, <clears throat> in the city of Islamabad, <laughs> in the city of Islam, and was talking with these Afghans. And they invited me to come over to their home. I said, okay. You know, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, hospitality is a little bit different there. So they, uh, I went over to their door. I had my bag over my shoulder. I said, yes, I've come to spend the night with you. Oh, they're a little bit surprised. 
So they said, okay, come in. So we had fun, and one of the younger brothers, just these guys living together, refugees from Afghanistan over in Pakistan, he was like Taekwondo, so we played around with that for a while. And then at one point I said, I just wanted to go and kind of go pray in the other room. And, oh, oh yeah, you want to pray? So they got me one of their prayer carpets, you know, for me. And so I just was praying for them in the other room for a while and then came out and we're talking again. And he asked me, excuse me, do you do ablutions? Now, what is ablutions? Have you ever seen this? Maybe you've seen it in TV or documentary or something where Muslims actually wash their face. They go to the mosque and they take off their shoes at the entrance. They go and step inside barefoot. They wash their face and their hands and their feet. Have you ever seen that? Anybody? Just not very many? Okay, that's called doing ablutions. So in my eyes, anything I've seen, wrong thing. Or my ears, any wrong thing I've heard, or my mouth, so I'm washing this. Any wrong thing I've said in my hands, any wrong thing that I've done, clear up to the elbow. <laughs> and my feet, any wrong place I've been, I'm washing myself, symbolically cleansing off the wrong things that I have done in this world. What a picture of trying to cleanse ourselves before God that's completely ineffectual. So he asked me, have you ever done ablutions? And I sat down, well, you know, it's really good to clean the outside, to wash ourselves, cleanse ourselves, but the most important thing is to have a clean heart before God. We can sit there and wash all the outside, but the inside can be dirty and filthy all kinds of evil things. And so to help Muslims understand this, or Hindus or Sikhs or others, because I've had a chance to witness some with people, I would give specific examples. Anger and hatred. Evil thoughts inside the heart. And you can go through like Mark chapter 7, from from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. And then you just give them a list. And all these things makes us dirty and unclean. And God sees to our heart. So we know what is acceptable and unacceptable to God. And even if we wash the outside, we can be dirty inside and on our way to hell. Which Muslims believe in, by the way. Like a burning fire. <clears throat> We're on our way to hell. So the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And we can share these stories with these people. Then the Messiah, of course, will be preached to all nations. Repentance, forgiveness of our sins through faith in Jesus. There was a time I was in uh, Turkey, leading a team in Turkey, doing a summer mission trip there. And my wife and I were able to sit down with this one Muslim family who'd come to faith in Jesus. They were Iranian. And uh, the husband had come to know the Lord first. They were from northern Iran. And he was sharing with his wife, who was, she was a, you know, a staunch Muslim, wearing the black head scarf and black all the way down to her feet, and uh, was very committed to following Islam, and her family was committed to following Islam. And for them, that's loyalty to the Lord. Why would I be a traitor to God and turn from Islam? Islam means submission to God. My life is submitted to the Lord. But it's all twisted, God has taken the way in which he fashioned us, the, the very, the image of God in us in relationship with him, and Islam has twisted it, deformed it, made it ugly. So it's not the truth of the word of God and have a real relationship with the Lord. So this Muslim man had come to Christ, he was witnessing to his wife, and then, of course, <clears throat> his wife got all upset with him. I guess maybe he was sharing with others, too, some people were looking for him. They wanted to catch him and beat him or something. So he was kind of moving around a bit. Finally, he left Iran, went over to Turkey. And he was in Istanbul when we met them. And his family said, oh, just divorce him. You know, he's become an unbeliever. You know, he's uh, shame he's brought upon Islam. And so, you know, the Satan uses these types of emotional ties, even to that which is evil, to keep people from coming to the truth. So we pray. We love them, we pray, and then that helps them, of course, the Holy Spirit to come to the truth. So there he was, and his wife said, no, I need to give him a chance. He's my husband, he's the father of our two daughters. I need to give him a chance. So she went over to Turkey, and uh, he was sharing with her some more, and one night she had a dream. And in the dream, she was in this huge cesspool of black quicksand. It was filthy and disgusting, and she was sinking down to a 
sinking deeper and deeper. And uh, <clears throat> she cried out. She tried to get herself out. She couldn't. She was just sinking more. She cried out to her family to come and help her. Her family couldn't help her. She cried out to Muhammad to help her. Muhammad couldn't help her. She cried out to Allah to come and help me. He couldn't help me. But in the Quran, it says that Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary, that he was without sin, that he healed people, raised people from the dead. He's called the Word of God and a spirit from God. So these are like little bridges that we can use to start sharing the truth of the gospel message, applying it to a Muslim. So then she remembered this, and her husband had been witnessing to her, and she cried out to Jesus just as she was going, almost going under. And this big, strong arm came down, dressed in white, and lifted her out of the quicksand, that filthy quicksand, and put her on the solid ground right next to him. And she was ashamed. She looked down. Oh, I'm covered in this slimy, disgusting filth. It stinks. I'm covered in this. But finally, she opened up her eyes. And there was Jesus. Jesus standing there dressed in white. And she looked at herself, and she had been cleansed. She was dressed in white. She came to faith in the Lord. What a picture, then, of sin and repentance, of turning to the Lord, and not the disgusting practices of our past, our filthy ways, wrong ways of thinking and doing things and speaking, instead of following the Lord with all of our heart. So as a result of this, and I don't have any more time, can we think of a few principles that we can learn from the Gospel of Luke? First of all, we need to share a clear Gospel message. Yes, we can speak of Jesus as a healer, as a comforter, as a counselor. He is all those things. All these things are true. And the Lord does help us and those who are not yet believers in Jesus. He helps us with our problems. But these are not the gospel message. Someone can be helped with all their problems, but still go to hell. And you're having a mission Sunday. And you're going to be giving <coughs> towards your mission's budget. What is a an application that we can take from this towards missions giving. If there is any ministry, even a compassion ministry, but they are not including the gospel message, the clear gospel message, and that's not a priority within their ministry, personally, I don't support that. I don't give one penny to that. Secondly, stand firm in the truth. There is only one gospel message. We saw through this in the introduction to Luke, that there are many different backgrounds. <clears throat> People from all kinds of cultures and languages and religions, <clears throat> no matter what their background, they need to receive this gospel message and apply the unchanging truths of it to themselves. They need to put their faith in Jesus. Finally, let's be a proactive witness. This is a command. The Lord was speaking to the disciples and through them to the rest of the church about going and being witnesses to the Lord. We witness to what we personally have seen and experienced. I can share my testimony with a Muslim. And when a Muslim hears that I have a relationship with Jesus, that I know I am forgiven, I'm going to be in heaven, that is attractive to a Muslim or to a Sikh or to anybody else. That the Lord loves me and I experience his love. He's been helping me and with all my hurts and problems in life, but he's also forgiven me, and he's accepted me. So we are to be a proactive witness. So I mentioned about compassion ministry. Compassion ministry, if you look at the Great Commission, whether it's in Luke or there's some parts of it in Mark, which is um, proclaim the gospel of all of creation, Matthew, the emphasis on disciple, all nations, etc., there's no mention of the great of the of the of compassion ministry, but we see in the rest of the scripture we are to love people. <clears throat> From this, then I realize doing compassion ministry and the Great Commission is just that I'm re-emphasizing to you: make sure that whatever ministries you support, that they are sharing the good news, the gospel message. And as we are disciples, we see the disciples in the in the scriptures in the Gospel of Luke, to whom the Lord was speaking. And then to us, what does he say to us? First, give ourselves to the Lord. In Corinthians, it mentions this. And then, give financially to the Lord. 
So why don't we pray together? And I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to help us, to help you to share your testimony and the gospel message with your neighbors. So let's not be afraid. Let's love these people. Let's pray for our neighbors, our contacts, our friends, no matter what background they're from, and share the gospel with them. Would you be willing to pray with me for that? Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray that this group of brothers and sisters in Christ would not be afraid in any way, Lord, but be able to love their neighbors, to reach out to them, to connect with them, Father. In whatever fashion, whatever gifts and abilities you've given for them. And Lord, that there would be openness and opportunities for them to share some truth from the Word of God, to bring them to church, or bring them to a small group, or in other ways, Lord God, to influence them towards faith in Jesus Christ, that they wouldn't be held back by fear. We renounce fear, Lord. Fear is not from you, but faith. And that you would encourage and empower each one here, Lord, that together as parts of this, this local body of Christ to be a shining witness to their community. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank amen. you for letting me go a few minutes over. Well, no problem. Thank you.